This episode is brought to you by SRB Field Rests. Your shotgun, bow, or rifle is an extension of who you are as a hunter. Whether you're hunting snows in a muddy mess of a field, mallards in the marsh, or whitetail from a ground blind, SRB Field Rests has your back. A local Kansas company that provides an easy to use, simple, and ergonomically effective solution to just awkwardly holding onto your gun or your bow when you do not need to. Allowing you to have more freedom, comfort, and safety in the field. Enter discount code FOULFRONT at checkout for 10% off your order of any SRB field rest today. This episode is also brought to you by Oak Barn Beef, a direct-to-consumer, family-owned farm that delivers high-quality, DNA-tested, dry-aged Nebraska beef from their family to yours. You can select from a wide variety of boxes. My personal favorite is the Husker Beef Package, which combines jerky, ground beef, steaks, and a brisket. These packages are perfect for families, get-togethers, out-of-town hunts, or for you outfitters looking to upgrade your table fare for your clients. Order yours today at oakbarnbeef.com. Welcome to the Foul Front Podcast, a part of the Waypoint Outdoor Collective. I'm your host, Ben Page, and this is your source for hunting, outdoors, and conservation conversations. In an eclectic and sometimes unorganized fashion, I appreciate you coming by. All right, today on the Foul Front, I am joined by Wayne Saunders, a retired game warden and host of the Warden's Watch podcast. This was a super awesome, awesome interview. Uh, but yeah, let's just get into it. How you doing today, Wayne? I'm doing great. And you, Ben? I'm doing good. I'm glad to have you on here. Uh, huge fan of your new podcast that's out, uh, The Warden's Watch. I think you've made it pretty high. I think twice you've uh, you've won my, my Friday episode uh, countdown. Uh, I'm just a big fan of that. How is that going for you? It's going extremely well, and and th- thanks for being a fan because that's as you know that's what we need as fans, and we need people to put out that information, to, uh, other people that are going to enjoy it, and you know as podcasters, I think we enjoy what we do. We we talk about something we love, and when you make that connection and you can share that connection to whether it's a sportsman, sportswoman, um, someone that's in your you know venue as far as a work job, whether you're a park ranger, a game warden, you know, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife officer, you know, to, to be able to share your experiences and others is just uh, is dynamite, I think, because we just love hearing about catching the bad guy. And as a sportsman, I want to hear about catching the bad guy, too. And game wardens love hearing other game warden stories. So it's, it's a big sharing type of thing of something that I love to do and I love to catch the bad guy as a game warden. So I like sharing that with, with other people and hopefully they like listening to it. Yeah. I, uh, I've had nothing but positive comments from the people that I have uh, referred to your show. Um, some saying it's like cops for the radio, um, for game wardens. It's great. Yeah. I'm waiting for the poacher to get on there and, uh, you know, poo poo it. Cause <laughs> there's a few people out there that really don't care for me. Well, yeah, well, I'm sure not some nefarious folk out there that uh, don't like their game wardens. No, absolutely. And there's a good reason they don't. And usually the game warden's not too fond of them. But on the other hand, I've always had some good relationships with poachers. You know, it's kind of the the, the cartoon with the, the sheepdog and the wolf. Uh, you know what he does and he knows what you do. And the nice thing is when you catch him, he's like, you got me. You know, and we go to court and th- there's no problem. Then you get the other guy that you got red handed and he's like, it's not me. It's not me. It's not me. Until I throw a picture in front of him of him dumping out a bunch of bagels on a bear illegal bear site. And he's like, how did you get that photo? <laughs> and I'm like, you know, satellite imagery, you know, man, no. So but it wasn't that I just told that story the other day, you know, a, a, a guy that, you know, violated he preseason baited bears in New Hampshire and. You know, we knock on his door and we say, hey, we're here, Leo, because you preseason bait. He's like, yep, you got me. You know, and I'm like, what What a nice guy. And every time I see him, he, he, he busts my chops. I bust his chops. And, you know, we, we move on compared to the other guy that was in the same ring with him that denies, 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 denies until he gets that photo 
right in front of his face of him dumping out bagels and the first words out of his mouth, how did you get that picture? You know, and it's because I'm good at what I do. That's how I got that picture. But, you know, those are, those are the types of warden, those are the types of poachers we deal with as wardens. And, it, and it, I appreciate the guy that says, hey, you got me. You know, the other guy that, you know, lies, 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 lies until you absolutely have him, you know, because, you know, when we, when we do those arrest warrants, we make those arrests, you know, we want to make it solid. And when we go to court, because we got to tell the judge and we got to convince the judge that this guy's guilty. So we want to have all the information and all the goods on these poachers. So, but I still appreciate the guy that gets caught and admits to it. An interesting, uh, an interesting comment that I don't think many people would expect to hear. So not by definition, I think everybody knows by, you know, definition what a poacher is, but uh, to you, what makes a poacher? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a guy that violates the law. That order it's steal. It's stealing from everybody. So it, it may not be the typical the night hunter. That's the typical poacher everybody thinks about the jack light or the guy that goes intentionally out at night, shines deer, and shoots him. Yeah, I, I guess I got a broader definition of a poacher. A poacher is a guy that has a bait pile behind his house that has the, the light on it. So when the light moves and the demotion sensor comes on, he shoots his deer with his crossbow and he he tags it legally, you know, and, and that's the poacher. Or, or the guy that is driving out at night and sees that deer in his headlights and, and whacks it, you know, five minutes after the illegal portion. Or the guy that illegal bear baits, you know, a month preseason to, to get a jump on everybody else that, that's hunting legally. So I guess most game violations, I would classify if you're viol- intentionally violating the law, I'd call you a poacher. Now, there's those, those guys that unintentionally do it, which... You know, that that's not, I don't put them in the same line as the poacher. Some guys, you know, failure to tag your deer upon killing. Some guys get all excited and they shoot a huge buck. This is very common too. They, they drag it out yeah. and they almost get into the car and there's a game warden standing in front of them with a flashlight and like, hey guys, how you doing? And he's all excited. You know, oh, I just shot this eight point buck and, you know, it's, it's my first or second, my biggest deer ever. And I'm like, yeah. And uh, did you tag it? And all of a sudden the fear of God comes into their face and they're like, uh not yet you know but that guy didn't mean to violate that guy was excited that guy and that that comes from a little experience too is you know get a little uh experience under your belt you can tell the type of people you're dealing with that guy didn't intentionally violate did he did he technically violate by not tagging that deer yes he technically violated am i going to take that nice buck that he's all excited about absolutely not you know that's that that that's crazy but unintentional violation but then you get the intentional violation, you know, the camp meet you hear. So the guy that shoots a skipper and they never tag it. Yeah. So or the ducks that they they stash in there and, you know, no one's around. I'll stash these underneath the seat so I can go get another limit. So th- those those guys are poachers. So that's not the unintentional thing. The guy that shoots, you know, one shot, he's got, a, you know, some of his limit there. Let's say you only got you're only allowed uh, one hen mallard. You shoot and you drop two hen mallards with one shot. And I've seen it happen, <laughs> you know, and that's the unintentional guy, you oh, yeah. know, that's the, the, geez, I violated, but did he mean to violate? No. You know, does that go in his buddy's bag that didn't have his two female mallets? Probably yes. And they continue on. So now the warden watches that he's got an over limit, but did he know that he intentionally did that? No. He saw those two ducks fall out of the sky at the same time with one shot. When he approaches him, does he lie about it or does he come clean? So those are the types of things that... You know, I, I guess I classify poachers as violators, but not intentional violators. Does that make sense to you, Ben? What? Yeah, no, it, it makes sense. It makes sense. What? Uh, okay, intentional violators. What's going on? You know, what? what's some themes, some common themes and personalities that you notice with the intentional poachers? What What makes them tick? What makes them a poacher? Good. Good question. Some of it's growing up in a poaching family, you know, grandpa poached, dad poached. So, you know, that's why I poach because everybody else has done it. Uh, some of it's greed. Uh, if you remember, and maybe you still have them in your area, the, the, the deer pools, you know, to get that biggest deer and there was thousands of dollars or a rifle involved. We had intentional guys going out there and cheating, whether it was baiting, whether it was night hunting, you know, trying to get that biggest deer any means necessary. It, it wasn't it wasn't a fair play because they wanted that gun or they wanted that money. So anytime that money comes into anything wildlife, 
you know, trouble exists. You know, I don't want to put down guides or anything like that, but uh, there's a lot of guide problems because the guide is out to, to make his clients happy and to move on to the next clients. And if he's not focused on the resource and, you know, why he's out there, he, he is focusing on money and he's not caring. So he's probably going to intentionally violate because it's easier. You know, do we throw out the corn here or do we do this because I'm going to move these on, you know, because I want to get these guys their ducks and move on to the next people so I can get them their ducks or, you know, when it goes on with moose and deer. And when money comes into it, that that has a tendency to to drive the illegalness of things. And that's that's worldwide. You know, you see it in Africa with ivory. You see it with gallbladders. It's just when money, you know, you see it with elvers, too, when money gets involved then cheating or taking shortcuts start. And when they get away with the first shortcuts, it goes the easier to the second shortcuts, the second shortcuts. Um, and it's just, it's, it's a money driven thing. And if money is what drives you, then there may be a problem. If you're out there for the resource and you're out there for the right reasons, you're out there to, to bring other people that probably have a little limited experience in hunting or they have limited access to hunting and you're guiding them in there for a good quality hunt and that's you what you want to do and that's you love doing it because you love being out there and you love being part of that thing then you're probably a really good guy but if you're out there to make a buck and to turn it around and to treat you know get the next next client out there to make another buck you're probably not the best guide so i guess it's what drives you if if i don't when I'm talking to, and I talk to quite a few guides just here and there. And if they're not focusing on, if I don't hear something about the experience or something of that nature, if they're not focusing on the experience, if they're telling you all about, Hey, limit this, limit that. We got this many birds. We got that many birds. Um, and if I don't hear anything, if I don't hear anything, uh, talking about experience or the stuff outside of the the hunting, I'm uh, usually a little turned off by that. And I, I don't go on a lot of guided hunts. I've been on maybe yeah, three. That's exactly what, you know, yeah. the people that listen to your show should be listening. If they do go on guided hunts, that's the kind of guide you want to go with. that talks about that quality hunt and talks about the experience. And, you know, uh, in Northern New Hampshire, deer hunting is pretty sparse. So I, I try to make it out of the experience. It's not really about killing that deer. It's about, spending the day in the woods you know spending the day on the marsh and seeing things flying around and you know you, you know practice up a little before you go so you can hit something if it comes in because i've seen some pretty poor thoughts um but right. you're right if they're not talking about the experience and they're not selling an experience and that's all about bag limits or filling your bag then yeah you're probably you probably should call another guy till you hear that word you know hey i'm, I'm not out here i can't guarantee you anything but I will guarantee you, you have a good time and you'll have a great experience. You know, that's what we should be selling. Um, you know, we want success too, but most, the, most of those guys that are, want that experience are successful. But, that, you know, whenever money seems to come involved or, you know, uh, bragging rights, so to speak, that, that's when poaching happens. And uh, we're never getting rid of it. We'd love to exterminate every little bit of it, but it's just those pieces of humanity that, that, drive some people that uh, we're, we're, we're gonna always going to see it. Yeah. And before we get to some of the bad guy stories, which I'm sure that's probably why everybody's tuning in right now, of course. Um, you you mentioned something earlier that kind of uh, prompted uh, an impromptu question here for me. Uh, the letter versus the spirit of the law and where you – kind of in the field are forced to make decisions uh, of those of that nature. Can you kind of describe what it's like being on the game warden side? Um, Absolutely. And I side? can't speak for every game warden because personality comes in this. So uh, experience comes in with this. You know, everybody knows when there's a new cop in town, right? I, you know, the new kids out there stopping taillights, this, that, and the other thing. And as you get a little more age on you, you start to look for the quality stops and not the quantity, so to speak. So I think that there's a lot that goes into our decisions in the field, our personalities, our experience, and, and we bring those into it. So you may get a bad, you know, not a bad game warden, but you may get a, an inexperienced game warden that throws the book at you right away. 
you may get the other guy that understands and can read a lot more of this into it than the young kid can. And, you know, so that, that ends up being your experience. And uh, sometimes it starts off with a bad experience. You know, I've had guys point guns at me unintentionally. Well, unintentional or not, that sends me through the roof. I've grabbed, grabbed barrels and taken them away from my leg. I've done all kinds of things. That starts a bad footing with me, Glenn, uh, Ben. I've already started, you know, I'm, I'm already on the, <laughs> my hackles are raised and I'm a little ticked off. So that starts yeah. a bad experience because I've already had one with a hunter. So in making those decisions, you know, and some of them are easy to make, you know, if I'm checking a duck hunter and he's got lead on him, that that's an easy one for me, you know, because uh, especially, you know, the older crowd seems to, to believe that lead is still better than anything. And they keep a few extra ones in their pockets or something like that. So that that's easy for me. And over limit of ducks is easy for me. Um, th- those types of things are, are pretty black and white in my book. It's the, the, it's the guy that shoots, you know, goes and shoots and has an over limit when I just watched him dump, you know, two hens and he's got two hens in his bag or, you know, he would have just had one more, but that shotgun shell took out the other one. You know, if I see that and I can understand that that was an honest mistake, then yeah, I grab that duck and, you know, you know, or I come up to him, he's like, geez, I just shot and, you know, I took two hens out and I had one. I didn't mean to kill him. And, you know, you have to see that kind of thing, though. That That's that's the tough thing. And I always like doing surveillance, especially on duck hunters, because it, they, they sit in a blind and with a spotting scope or a set of binoculars, you can watch and you can you can tell what kind of hunters they are, what kind of shots they are, the equipment they're using, and you can get right into it. So, you know, the type of hunter you're dealing with right of way. You know, I watch guys shoot uh, ducks all day long, and they must have been running out of shells. They must have shot two boxes of shells while I watched them and never, ever hit a duck. And guess what? The ducks started landing, and they started sluicing them, right? On, you know, that's that was their way to, to kill the ducks. And then, then they started killing them. And, you know, <laughs> that, that's un, whether you think it's unsportsmanlike or not. You know, it's still legal, so there was there was no issue there. But that that was the way it, it went that day. Um, but ma- making that decision in the field is, is totally yeah. up to the individual warden. And, and there's so many types of, uh, elements that come into it to make those decisions. So it's hard to, to sit back here and say on each violation, what I would do, you know, without coming into it and what another warden would do would might be totally different. And I, you know, as a, as a supervisor, a Lieutenant, I'd always support my guys. You guys made that decision, you know, maybe, you know, you should have thought of this or that or that, but whatever, I'm going to support you because I'm sure you had a reason to make those decisions. So, and I, I always worked with new guys to start off so that they understand there's a gray area. It's all not black and white, that honest mistakes are made. And sometimes the spirit of the law is better than the letter of the law. So that being spoken, there are other people out there that are very black and white and I, I think that's in every role of life we see that. So, and it's more about personality, understanding, and and learning. You know, people. So that if that answers your question, I mean, <laughs> I kind of danced around with it. Without getting into particular. <laughs> no, that's good. Yeah, it's good. All right. So I, uh, you know, I I always welcome the game warden to my blind um, because I just I know that I have all my permits. I know that I'm not you know, doing anything illegal. There's always that, that little ghost or that little voice back there saying, yeah, but is everything good? Like, have you checked everything? Um, I kind of wanted to talk about how do we have a successful interaction with a game warden in the field as a hunter? Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a good one. And uh, the easy thing is when you see some, one of a warden unload your gun, you know, unload it safely. That that's, Boy, is that nice, especially when you're in the blind, Ben, because the first thing, you know, when I used to check and I check guns a little differently than everybody else did, because I'd have them unload their gun and I would load their gun up to see if they had a plug in it. And I, you know, except for putting one in the chamber, I'd hand them back to the, the, the third round and say, hey, it's good. I didn't have a plug checker. I just uh, I consistently did that because it had them unload their gun right away. I, I think that's a great thing 
when checking do i see a lot of deer hunters do it no should they not you know it's pretty quick if they can put down their gun and not unload it that's fine but definitely you know in a blind or something that's just a a nice courtesy to see and it puts me at ease because i've had so many issues of bad gun handling um, whether it's one individual or two and especially if there's two or three in the blind uh, shotguns start going places and you can almost tell the experiences of gun handling too you know some of those guys you know break open it's easy break it open she's on she's safe you know the auto loaders those guys take a little time you know but it, it's just it makes it safe for everybody and it just sends me a message that, uh, on a level that these guys know what they're doing because they saw the game warden they unloaded their guns, so this is how we begin our check. And what a great way to start checking somebody is with an unloaded gun. You know, on a rifle, move your bolt back. It's it's just, it, it's easier. It makes me feel more at ease, too, because now I'm not watching the barrel all the time if you're holding it in your hands or you have a juvenile with you. I've had issues with juveniles and, and gun handling, and they're novice at it. So, you know, Dad, you know, have a hey, you know, son, go put your gun over there, lay it down on the ground until we're done checking the game warden with the game warden. So, and then that puts everybody at ease. You have both hands to, to work through your wallet to find your paperwork, to see your licenses, your your stamps, and, and things like that. So, that, I think that's a good way. And, uh, you know, I, I always start off being nice. I don't write, go right for the license, but everybody knows what I'm there for. So, usually they're already getting that out as we're small talking. So, and then I'm looking, looking at bags, yeah. looking that you know what what they have in their hands and uh exactly are they comfortable with me being there and usually there's always a little bit of tension with with the game warden there regardless unless you know him very well you know there's always that little bit of tension even though he's there to you know he's your friend and he's there to, to help and he's there to, to make sure everybody's on the same page and when you have it but there's always that little bit of tension like you said you know do i have everything you know, and how many times have I handed, you know, a, a duck stamp back and said, hey, can you sign this for me? Here's my pen. Oh, geez. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, yeah no, I, I get it. So um, that's probably the number one violation, I think, in my career for as far as duck hunters went, you know. Yeah, sign your sign your stamp. So they don't have to have it affixed, actually. some A lot of people think they need it affixed, but a lot of collectors, you know, will collect those stamps after and keep them. So they actually don't have to be affixed to the license, but they have to be signed. It's like an endorsement. Yeah, I, I guess, uh, you know, I never thought about this too much, but, uh, you know, cops have a pretty dangerous job, but not every single person that a cop interacts with is, is armed, where a game warden, pretty much every time you interact with somebody, they're, they're armed. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I have a friend that's the chief of police and, you know, he'd jump in my cruiser with me and we'd go check hunters. And he's like, Wayne, I just don't know how you do this. Everybody's got a gun. And I said, well, you get used to it and you have to learn people. And you have to learn attitudes and personalities and the way they're talking to you. So you can interpret if this is going to be a good interaction or a bad interaction. And, and you know, 90% of the people game wardens deal with are good people. You know, there are those 10% that are very bad people. And, yeah, then guns are, are very much in play and you take it a lot more serious. So, but, yeah. Okay, so we've un we've unloaded our gun. Um, and you know, now we're digging through licenses and stuff. What other, uh, what other things can we, you know, do to have a, a more positive reaction? Uh, it depends how your dog is. If you got a friendly dog, that's great. If you got a Chesapeake Bay Retriever, you might want to, you know, make sure they're leashed pretty good. So <laughs> it's the only dog that ever bit me or uh, she didn't actually clamp down. I was sneaking up on a duck blind watching and, uh, she caught wind of me and that dog came out of that blind heading and I stood up and I started yelling game warden. And you should have seen this guy's face in the blind. He, he, oh, he was screaming at the top of his lung and the fear of God was in his face. And that dog was coming for me. And I, I don't know, I probably got four game wardens out before she came and I put my arm up and she put her mouth around my arm. She never clamped down. She had just look in her eye, just, we were like mid eyes and we're staring at each other and she never clamped down. And that guy is screaming as he's running and he gets her, but she never put her teeth in me. But I'll tell you, that's the closest I've gotten bit by, uh, you know, sneaking up on a duck blind. And uh, I don't know who was more scared. So that, the, do the dog is probably another thing. If you got one of those chessies that, that likes to bite people, you, you might want to leash them up or something. So labs are great dogs. I've never had any issues, but I know there are some of those labs that, 
you know, might, might want to be. So good. If you got, if you have a dog in the blind and it needs to be tied up when the game warden's there, that would be a great thing to do as well. Um, but you know, just, you know, cordial, get your paperwork out, you know, depending how long I was checking duck hunters one time and I bet 200 ducks landed right in his, in his you know, in his decoys. And he's there with his, you know, his paperwork and his eyes. He's like, can I shoot those? I'm like, go right ahead. So, you know, and, and he had to load back up, but they sat right there for him. And then he, he shot all three surrounds and he never touched one duck, all 200. You know, it was a big flock got up and he never touched one. <laughs> I was like, and I'm like, yeah, sometimes I bring good luck and sometimes I bring bad. So I brought it both in those cases. <laughs> Do you ever wait? Um, you know, like you see, okay, hey, these guys are having some good shooting, fast action, but you're, you know, you're like, I can't just leave this. I got to go check them out. Uh, is there, is that ever? Oh, I usually wait if you? they're having some good shoots. You want to sit there and watch them to make sure they don't over limit. So if there's plenty of action, you know, it, it, action for them is action for me because I can sit there and watch all day guys shoot ducks. It's awesome. You know, just as much as they're having fun, I'm having fun watching them shoot them. So, so yeah, I, you know, am I going to get bored if I'm sitting in the woods and they're not doing anything? Probably. But if there's a lot of action and there's a lot of ducks flying and a lot of ducks coming in, I'm sitting there till they're done. So when, and I'm counting their ducks, I'm making notes, I'm checking the, you know, the guy in the the reed camo with the funky little hat there. He's, you know, he's got three ducks and, you know, try to identify them too. Um, whether they're mallards or whatever you're hunting, you know, you're going to identify your ducks. So you want to know what they're shooting in, as individuals, because remember you have an individual bag. It's not a group bag, which again, I think we've run into a lot of problems. I came upon, you know, eight guys hunting one time and there was a pile of ducks and I'm like, so whose ducks are whose? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm like, yeah, why don't we separate these out? And they weren't over their limits. They still, they were still well within, you know, shooting the limits, but they had a pile of ducks there. I'm like, so claim your ducks. So everybody claimed their ducks. I'm like, now keep your own piles. These are your individual ducks. And that's what you need. So that, that's what you need to stay. Just like fishing. It's not a group, you know, creel limit. It's a, it's what, what you're supposed to catch. So when I'm watching fishermen, it's the same way. This guy's doing a really good job. He's a really good fisherman and he catches more fish. Well, guess what? It's not a group thing. He's he's caught ten fish. He's over the limit, you know, by five in our state. So on trout. So the same with ducks. If one guy's a really good shot and slaying the ducks, and he's he's filling the bag for everybody else. Again, can't do that. That's that's the bag for him as an individual, not as a group. Yeah, and I, you know, I I obviously it's sometimes it's hard to tell um, who shot what in you know, certain situations, but yeah. at least when you're out retrieving, that's when the, this, you know, the conversation needs to be had. Hey, this was in my lane. Yeah, but I shot at that one too. Okay. I'm pretty sure you got this one. At least when they get back to the blind, you need to have those sorted out. Would you say that that's fair? That, that's very fair. No, nope, but absolutely. I remember, you know, when I was in Oregon, when goose hunting for the first time and, dropped one out and I, the only one fell and i was like did anybody else shoot at that goose you know and they're like nope <laughs> no you know because i was like did i really hit that <laughs> that's funny so yeah so you, yeah you're right you need to have that conversation and you need to know who shot what but yeah when you're shooting and there's a bunch of guys shooting at a bunch of geese or ducks you know you, you claim them and hey was i shooting that duck were you shooting that duck you know it fell it's dead so and I'm sure sometimes they get leveled out with the bags, which I think is, is fine because, you know, that, that, that happens. You know, you can't, you know, if one guy, you know, is done and he's sitting there and the other guy is shooting, that's another story. But, yeah, it's, it's, it can be very difficult at times. You shoot the wrong duck. It's teal season and you shoot a wood duck. What do you do? Yeah, best to report yourself. That's the, the best thing to do. So, and if you report yourself... I'll never say a hundred percent, but I have never, you know, held that against somebody, you know, I'll be like, thank you. I'll take the duck and that's the end of it. Yeah. So when you don't report yourself and you get that caught in your bag, that's another thing. Right. So, right. And then time from maybe you're leaving to when you, you can make it to a phone or something and you do have it in your bag, you know, that, that, that can be an issue too. So, and I've had that happen with, uh, Spruce grouse, uh, guy coming out from hunting, you know, sees us, um, 
we're, we're kind of doing, we're checking, you know, we're talking about everybody that's coming out. And he's like, yeah, I'm looking for you guys. And I'm like, why? I shot a spruce grouse by accident. You know, the dog flushed him and, you know, I just pulled up and shot him and here's a spruce grouse. And in New Hampshire, spruce grouse is protected. So, mm. um, you know, he had it in his bag. He was coming out. So when he saw us, he stopped, you know, handed us a spruce grouse. So I took it at face value and said, you know, thank you a lot. I wrote him a warning. He knew he wasn't supposed to shoot a spruce grouse, so here's your warning for shooting a spruce grouse. So, and that was the end of it. So, and I think for most people, that's the end of it. If you come clean right away, you know you're you're leaving the blind. You got this duck, and you were going to report it. And here's the warden coming up to you. Hey, warden, I know you're probably not going to believe this, but I, I got I got a duck that I shouldn't have. I shot it by accident. And I was going to call you, and here you are. So, you know that's going to be one of those judgment calls in the field. You know, but for people to come right out and say that, yeah, maybe they saw the ward in the field and they think, you know, I'm going to be caught anyways. But, you know, some of us weigh it and say, geez, you know, that that, that could be the truth because it's happened to me before. So the problem is we get lied to a lot. I mean, it's hard to believe, yeah. Ben, but wardens get lied to a lot and then we get calloused. We we start believing everybody lies to us. We, you know, think our kids lie to us. We think our wife lies to us, you know. <laughs> so we have to take a step back every time and say, hey, wait a second, you know. Not everybody lies. And I'll tell you, the, the guys that have gotten a break from me is usually the guys that tell the truth as much as I can. When they come clean and say, yep, this happened, man, I'm going to treat them the best I can because that doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, what happens to those, you know, the the game that you guys have to confiscate? What what ends up happening? Does It goes to collection, like you have to collect it for a certain amount of time, right? Exactly. It has to go through the court procedures. Um, ducks, they go into a freezer usually. And then, you know, I take them to court. You know, when I had days of court, uh, federal court, when I was a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Refuge officer out in Oregon and Washington at Umatilla Refuges, I took my coolers to court for my over limits. And you brought the coolers into court, which was kind of funny. Uh, but I, I'll tell you, I, I had the best experience out there in court because I uh, I brought my coolers in and I had a great, you know, assistant U.S. attorney and he was all into wildlife cases and everything. So he prosecuted all my cases. The other U.S. attorney was a female and she didn't really get the whole thing. So she she negotiated all of my other cases out. So which didn't have some of the best uh, outcomes. I wasn't real happy. But this this U.S. attorney brought me in and, uh, you know, I, I started off with a, an over limit of ducks and the judge it was his last time he was sitting as a judge. And the first question he asked those guys, he goes, were they all green heads or do you have some hens too? And when he said green heads, I'm like, uh, this judge knows what he's talking about. He's, he's, mm. he's a hunter. So, and they were like, no, your honor, we, we have hens too. And he's like, and he says to me, he's like, let me tell you boys, this judge stuff is a hobby for me. I'm a professional duck hunter. And I take offense to what you, and he just chews them out and finds them guilty and I'm like, this is awesome. And the next case I had was a lead case. And he starts going off how much he, he hates steel shot, you know, and how it wounds ducks and this and that. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to lose this case. And at the end of him standing on his soapbox, he's like, but I'm an officer of the court and I have to uphold the law. So I got to find you guys guilty, even though I don't agree with it and puts his gavel down. And I was like, wow, you know, that was probably the best fish and wildlife judge i've ever ever had i'm very sorry it was his last day that but i'm glad i get to experience that so but those those animals get brought into court um we, we've sometimes we process them like deer will process them and freeze them so we don't lose the meat um and once the case is resolved we can donate that to whether a soup kitchen or needy families or something like that uh, ducks don't have that doesn't happen with ducks they go in the freezer and they get freezer burnt by the time court goes around and they get thrown out unfortunately so that that's a resource loss but it's just because we can't process those efficiently and then to give you know something to a soup kitchen after that would just you know it's freezer burn it's bad probably by the time it rolls around to court so but we we can do with big game animals we can process them in some jurisdictions, other jurisdictions, they want the whole carcass preserved. In that case, guess what? That gets thrown out too, because the whole carcass fro frozen in a freezer time for court. Again, it's freezer burn. It's junk. It's no good to anybody, except maybe for coyote bait. 
but we usually end up dumping those. But if we can, you know, preserve the meat, we usually, you know, we have, have a little fun that the fishing game, at least in New Hampshire, we, we butcher it, everything gets done. And sometimes we recoup that in the cost of the case. We usually throw the cost of butchering in with the fines and then we let the hunters know, hey, this is all going to be donated after so it doesn't go to waste. And even the guys that violate, I think, appreciate that that doesn't get thrown out. I wish we could do it with small game too, but it's just not effective or efficient, so to speak. Not not efficient, yeah. Yeah, efficient. So but has to go to court so they can see the evidence. So before we talk a little bit about your your time in Oregon, um, do you think it would be best to give a brief uh, overview of your career, kind of where you've been, and then we can come back to um, Oregon? Yeah, no, that's 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 fair. Um, yeah, my career kind of starts of uh, geez when I was a kid, you know, just wanting to be a game warden. Um, I always talk about you know in my first podcast, I talk about the experience I had in the woods hunting with my father, grouse hunting, and turning around and seeing a game warden in the woods and seeing that big cowboy hat on his head, a Stetson. And, uh, you know, from that point on wanting to be that cowboy in the woods, that, that guy that, you know, just shows up out of the middle of nowhere and is just mysterious and, you know, the protector of the, the animals in the forest type thing. So I kind of had that in my head. So I went to the, the I actually rode around with the, the local game warden, Sergeant uh, Robert Bryant, uh, I ended up being a lieutenant before he retired, but that he was a sergeant for as long as I knew him. And I did ride alongs constantly. So, you know, with all hunting seasons, I'd jump in with him and it was fun. It was fun going with him to check hunters, make cases. Um, so uh, when I was getting ready to graduate high school, he brought some guys that had just been hired over to the house and they had gone to the State University of New York at Cobleskill. And he thought that was sounded like a really good college. These guys, you know, were pretty squared away and he was impressed with their schooling and it sounded like a good thing. So that's that's where I went. So I got an associate's degree from the State University of New York at Cobleskill, which is just outside of Albany between Binghamton and Binghamton and Albany right there. So and after I got that, I worked for uh, like the uh, Rangers in uh, the DEC Rangers Department of Environmental Conservation out of New Pulse. So I was a backcountry ranger in the Catskill Mountains. So that summer I got to hike around and kind of do some law enforcement, uh, more more educational type stuff of law enforcement. If there was any action, you know, needed to be taken, I would call a ranger in. But ranger was a, a pretty cool, cool job. So I, I went over to the National Park Service. Uh, it was a seasonal and I started uh, training in Silva, North Carolina they have a seasonal national park ranger school back then it was 10 weeks long and some outstanding training you know i've been on through a lot in my 23 years i've had a lot of training and some of the best training i think i got was from silva north carolina they brought some outstanding instructors in and they just did a really good job um to give us a certification so we could be a seasonal law enforcement officer for the national park service so from there, I went up to New River Gorge, West Virginia. I was a whitewater ranger there. I ran the New River. I ran the Golly River, which is one of the top 10 navigable bodies of water in the world. Did some paddling there. Uh, learned how to kayak. Uh, uh, did a lot of search and rescue, high angle rescue in New River Gorge. Uh, it's a, a big rock climbing area. Um, we did whitewater rescues all the time. I got to whitewater raft all the time. would throw out me and another guy. Uh, Jay Connerly would throw a, a kayak in the back and one of us would paddle the, the, the raft and the other one would paddle the kayak and we'd go down through rapids and switch on and off. And, you know, I just learned so much and had so much fun that summer. And we did a lot of rescues, did a lot of law enforcement and did a lot of education, which was really cool. But I, I kept moving on because I just wanted to soak up all that experience. And my next location was the Apostle Islands National Lakeshore in Lake Superior. And I got to run a 25-foot whaler and experience uh, Lake Superior, which is uh, <laughs> really, that should be one of the top navigable bodies of water in the world because that's the most scared I've ever been in a boat. As, uh, we had some serious waves that would swallow up that 25-foot whaler I couldn't see in or out of, and I'd have to navigate through that <laughs> to, to sometimes to get people off islands and things like that. And and again, the Park Service came up with these these training programs for the boats that was just you know, I'm probably the best. I'm a great boat operator. Well, I shouldn't say a great boat operator because, you know, the, as long as you use it, you keep those skills. 
back then I was a very good boat operator and I was very happy to get those skills. And even when I came on with New Hampshire Fishing Game, I was very confident boat operator. Um, to this day, well, when I was a lieutenant, I'd go down to the seacoast and I'd drive the big boats because that's, I like driving. So I didn't get seasick, but anyways, but I, I just, the experiences I got on the, on the Apostle Islands and Nationals, uh, Apostle Islands, uh, in Lake Superior were just priceless, but I did leave those again and went to Astig Island National Seashore where again, I used my boat skills down there. I was able to bring their wheeler up to snuff and, uh, do a lot of beach patrol, a lot of stuff that I never had done before, uh, DWIs, uh, a lot of traffic, a lot of uh, just breaking into cars and stuff because people would lock their cars in on the beach, plus all the sea life. We had whales, yeah. we had uh, seals that would come up on the shore, um, Sitka deer on the island. Uh, now they hunt whitetail. They didn't before. And boy, you could go up the island with a spotlight at night. And I'll tell you what, you'd see 14 point bucks on a regular basis. I was like, this place is crazy with deer. It was just phenomenal. Now this, this isn't, this isn't a, this is not a typical, uh, game warden career. Is it? I feel like, um, I feel like you're, you're talking about all these different places and all these different experiences. And I feel like the one or two game wardens I know, are, you know, been in Kansas and operating in Kansas for, you know, 13 years or Nebraska for 13 years, switched a zone or two or something like that. Yeah, um, I, this is, uh, yeah, no, I would, I would agree. And I, I think you're right. A lot of the game wardens that I know are, are probably very similar to that. And yeah, because I, I was trying to get experience to be a game warden. The best Avenue I thought was to do that seasonal law enforcement with the national park service. And, you know, get that experience. So every time it was time to move a park for a season, I'd look and see what kind of experiences that I could gain to bring myself to the table. So people would, you know, I would be noticed because back then, I mean, 23 years ago, it was tough being a game warden. When, I, when that job opened up, there was thousands of people applying and it was a very, very, very competitive job to get. So I was trying with every job to, to up myself, you know, the boat operations, the, you know, the water experience, yeah. you know, I'm a, I was rescue three certified as far as swift water rescue is there. Um, just the, the skill set that, that I was able to bring, you know, I got scuba site, scuba certified when I was in college. So I was an EMT when I was in New York, I went to EMT class. So I, I grabbed that EMT, which also helped me in the national park service move around because that EMT jumped out at them every time because it's not every seasonal park ranger that holds an EMT certification. So that 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 helped too. But that is, uh, yeah, I was building my resume, so to speak, to get this job. So yeah, I traveled and thank God I did because I it was just an awesome experience as a, as you know in my twenties, banging around the country, packing up every you know five to six months and moving somewhere else, which you know brought me to the Umatilla refuges because, you know, park, park ranger work is great in the summer and there's a lot of it in the summer. When it comes to the winter, guess what? There's very few seasonal park ranger jobs. I used to call the Virgin Islands on a regular basis. That guy's probably glad I got a full-time job because I used to call him like once or twice a month looking for a park ranger job during the winter down there. <laughs> so... Um, that would have been a cool experience too. And I actually got called by Alaska, but I had already accepted the job in West Virginia. So I had to wrangle St. Elias called me and I wanted to go to Alaska in the worst way to be a park ranger. And I was like, nope, I've already took a job. I already said yes to them. So I'm going to have to keep my word and, and go to West Virginia. But, um, but my first winter job was, uh, or fall winter job was Union Matilla Refuges in Washington, Oregon. And it's right on the Columbia River. And that's, this is where I became a duck cop. And, you know, I'll tell you, as far as hunting goes, it's probably the coolest law enforcement you can do is waterfowl. There's lots of action. There's, there's violations, numerous in some cases. Um, there's a lot of people, a lot of interaction. Uh, it was just, it was awesome. I got up, you know, early in the morning. I'd be out, you know, pre-dawn most of the time. You know, trying to find some duck hunters to set up on. And I was home usually by two and I'd grab my roommate's dog and we'd go out and hunt pheasants till sunset because that's on the refuge. You have to stop hunting on sunset, even, you know, upland game. So 
so that last hour was just awesome with uh, the hunting pheasants. So, um, but yeah, so uh, that that's where I became a duck hop just because I was looking for winter work. And Assateague Island uh, actually has a refuge there, Shinkateague National Wildlife Refuge. So I was able to make some contacts there. Uh, a guy that had been at Umatilla Refuges the year before that wasn't going to take the job again, you know, referred me. And uh, that's the reason I got the job out there and gave me that winter position. So I packed up my bags and drove across the country to to work there. And, you know, at first it wasn't very glamorous. I lived in a tool shed to start um, <laughs> my, 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 cause they're supposed to, they were supposed to have housing, but the, the trailer that I was going to live in, no, they hadn't vacated yet. So there was some downtime. There was like a month of downtime. So I lived in this tool shed and I'd walk across the street, across the, the compound to the maintenance uh, facility where there was a shower. So I'd shower there, but you know, back in those days I wasn't living on bread and water. So, you know, I was a young kid moving around, just doing these seasonal jobs and getting this experience. And uh, so it didn't take much for me. My, my friend that drove out with me couldn't believe I was going to live in a tool shed. Um, but I'm like, it's not, they're not charging me anything for the tool shed. So I, that, that was good with me. <laughs> yeah. What's the craziest uh, waterfowl story you got? Um, probably almost getting shot um, by a waterfowler unintentionally. Um, just, I, I had crawled up and I got a good vantage point and I was sitting there. They, they had quite a few ducks flying in. So, um, thank goodness I was laying in the reeds on my belly and I had a log. I was propped up against the log and I had my binoculars sitting on the log and, you know, they were shooting. It was getting towards, I guess, 11 ish. So there wasn't a whole lot flying. And all of a sudden this one Drake Mallard comes and he lands right in front of me, probably 10 feet away. And those guys, next thing I know, I got barrels blazing. You know, I, I watched them like train. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. So I curled up behind that log as the, the shot was going through the reeds above me and never got shot. So, but that, that, and then they never hit the duck either. The duck took off quacking, rack, 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 you know, off it goes. And I'm like, geez, I'm bro. You know, and it was a, it was a good poke. I mean, it was probably 60 yards, but they all opened up on him. Um, and I, thank goodness I had that log that I was, you know, just propped up my binoculars on and, uh, were watching. So, but those guys unintentionally, you know, wasn't their fault really. Cause they didn't know I was there, nor should I have been there. But, um, what are the odds of that duck? Yeah, how'd that con- how'd that conversation go? Yeah, I didn't even let him know it happened because I wasn't going to let him. You know? <laughs> oh, you know, I, I, I you, weaseled my way out. They don't know. They don't know. I, I went all the way right around, and you know, again, I was thank goodness I was safe. I didn't take any BBs, but I just you know I didn't really want him to know that they just blasted away at the game warden either because I think that would have hurt my pride a little too. So, but and. Then- Sure. And they hadn't done anything sure. wrong all day. You know, I'd been watching them for a while. So it was just getting to that point where I think they were like one or two ducks from their limit. So I was hanging and waiting to see if they were going to fill it. So, yeah, that, that was that was probably the mer- most unnerving thing I had happened there. Um, you know, it was just a, it was a cool place because we got to see all kinds of ducks and identification. I mean, waterfowl hunters know that's that's key. And I get to identify them in hand, which is pretty awesome because, you know, I don't have to look at what they're flying. You know, that's your job. My job, I get it in the hand. Now I got it. So every now and then I run into something I didn't know. It wasn't common. I'd bring it up. I'm like, yeah, I got to check this duck out. It looks a little funny. You know, I'd bring it up to the truck and I get my book out, flip through it. I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. You know, my uncle has my uncle has a great story about that. Um, I, I can't remember what it was. It was I, it might have been a wood duck teal situation, but. Um, the game warden came up to him and my uncle said, well, geez, how am I supposed, there's, there was, you know, 40 teal. How was I supposed to, uh, identify this one particular, I can't remember what they were supposed to be discriminating against. And, um, he goes, well, I don't know. You tell me, Mr. Duck Hunter. (laughs) And, uh, he, he carries that with him almost as a, like a little bit of a, he's like, yeah, game warden got me good on that one. So. Yeah, and, and you know, just experiencing the Columbia River with three hundred thousand mallards rafted off of the refuge was just, uh, you know, in, intense for a hunter, intense for a game warden. Just to, to see that every day, the eagles flying over looking for cripples. What what years was this? Uh back in the early nineties. So I, it, yeah, so it would have been probably ninety four. 
Um, cause I came on with fishing game in 95 and I would have gone back there in a heartbeat if I hadn't get the game warden job. So, because I, that was probably the, well, the park ranger stuff was really good too. It was all really good. Those years, uh, very fond memories of, you know, whether it's whitewater rafting in West Virginia or working duck hunters in Umatilla refuges. So, but that probably gave me the, the experience I needed to be a game warden, Eastern game wardens, at least in New Hampshire, that we have some ducks, but we don't have anything like out there you know we I, I tried to go duck hunting here and i got bored silly i went back to bow hunting deer because you know just after you best or in your country you know you actually expect to see ducks and you know our flyway just isn't even close to compares to what your flyway is so it's sad <laughs> you, you gotta work really really hard for your ducks here compared to anywhere else um, and so, okay. And then you're, you become a game warden and, uh, kind of want to, I want to ask you a couple, you know, stories, uh, or a couple questions about your time as a game warden that I'm sure you've told these stories around a campfire multiple times. And hopefully if there's any future, you know, game wardens listening to this, then, you know, that's good for them. And, uh, obviously hopefully to get a little bit of entertainment, uh, you know, for the rest of us kind of want to talk about, um, who's the, What's the baddest guy? You know, you were talking about bad mm-hmm. guys. And uh, what was the what was the baddest guy doing for you? I mean, the the, the baddest guy, <laughs> I, I probably didn't catch. That, that, that's the half the problem. I I, <laughs> I I got close a couple times, um, but but you know, and that, I, I hate talking about the guys I didn't catch, but. There are certainly ones out there, and every game warden knows who his clientele is. And believe me, sometimes my lieutenant would pull me back because, you know, as a young warden, I was could be ferocious. And, uh, you know, I had screaming matches, and I knew I was right. And to this day, I know I was right. So, you know, when you, when you talk about bad, you know, are you talking about drug dealer bad? You're talking about killing our resources bad? Um, you know, there's been some, certainly some very bad people. Um, one is dead now after he killed four people, shot me and shot a few other, you know, law enforcement officers, but that incident, he ended up dead. So he was probably the baddest one I encountered, but it wasn't really a fishing game issue. It was responding to something I didn't know about. So, and I ended up seeing him and pursuing him into the state of Vermont and uh, he ambushed me. So that's probably the baddest guy that I was trying to catch. And again, I didn't catch, I got shot in the, in the line of duty doing it. So, you know that, but then I think about some of the poachers, one, one that I caught and I talk about it in my best case is uh, my second podcast. And, you know, these back, you know, and it was funny, Ben, cause you asked me what a backyard poacher was. Or a back, you know, backyard hunter, yeah. and and I'll tell you, these backyard guys are so hard to detect if you don't know about them, and because it, they they don't have that venue to to move, you know, they go right out their back door, whether they have a pile of bait, uh, an emotion light, or whether they you know walk to a tree stand that's you know just behind their house. A, you don't know they're out there hunting. You don't know what times they're hunting. And the only reason you, you start to suspect things is maybe some neighbors or maybe, um, you know, they're killing, consistently killing big animals. And, yeah, I've never checked them. I don't know where they're hunting. You know, you start getting suspicious yourself because if you kill a big buck year after year after year, you're either very good or you're cheating. So that's my job to figure out whether you're very good or you're cheating. So. And there are some very, very good hunters out there that are very successful all the time. And there are some cheating people out there. So, and that's what a game warden does. So I think, you know, the guy that was killing those deer consistently and, and I investigated it and I, I, you know, I remember knocking on that door and him opening the door and I could smell the deer and we had a good relationship. He knew me, I knew him. Um, and eventually I got that deer and uh, I prosecuted him for night hunting. I don't know how many times he did that, but I can, it was a lot. And I don't even, I know I didn't break him because he went and bought a crossbow. So no one would hear the sh- shots anymore. So I, I feel like 
he was a bad mm. poacher because he probably destroyed our resource like nobody else has in that neighborhood ever and probably continued to do it just again out the back door and very very hard you know to catch so you know bad guys i guess they're you know uh, dealt with drug dealers when you you you're doing search warrants on houses that people are killing a lot of animals it, it interacts with drugs sometimes so we've had some cases that we've run into some serious drugs and you know usually when we do our warrants and stuff state police or the local police are involved so it's really nice because then they can take all the drug stuff and we get all the the game violations so and and doing a warrant can be very hairy too because you know we always did knock warrants i never did a no knock warrant um so we knocked and usually told them why we were there and, and got that out. But, you know, when you go into somebody's house to search it, yeah, it's not a pleasant experience for them at all. So you got to watch these people. You got to keep an eye on these people. You got to keep everybody safe because, you know, again, A, these are people that are pretty unsavory type of people that you got to keep an eye on just in case something snaps in them and they go for a gun or they decide it's this time, you know, or they're on their drugs and, or they need to be on their drugs and they can't be on their drugs because you're there and they're strung out. So, you know, specific stories, you know, I, I, I talk about that one case, especially, you know, I just, I, I just love that. I smelled the deer and that comes from, you know, the kid that never hunted growing up wouldn't ever know the smell of a deer. You know, when he opened that door and, you know, the smell of the deer, and then he, he was trying to hide his hands from me, and he had a nice sheath on that was empty. So those are things, ding, 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 in my head. I'm like, oh, this, hey, I smell the deer. So, and he invites me into his house, Ben. He invites me, come on in, Wayne, come on in, like we're best buds. So, and he, and he goes right to the bathroom and scrubs and scrubs and scrubs his hand, and his wife can't talk. She's sitting on the couch, and she's, blah, 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 blah. she can't even talk because I'm there. So, you know, in the first place, I'm like, hey, I got a report of a, you know, a shot mm-hmm. fired up here. He's like, oh, I haven't heard a thing. I said, well, I'd like to look around anyways. And he's like, you know, okay. And he said, where do you want to look around? I said, your garage. Oh, I can't do that. You know, I want to, you know, I don't want you to know, you know, I don't want you to get confused between legal deer and illegal deer. And I looked at him. I'm like, isn't that my job? <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah, I know. But I, I can't let you do that. So my lieutenant was actually late and waiting down at the bottom of the hill and I grabbed my the microphone so he could hear because I said, I got to get a flashlight too because he was going to let me look around the house. And, and I called my lieutenant. I said, yeah, we're going to need to do a search warrant here. And I let the guy hear that too. So, and as we're walking around the house, you know, I knew he had a bait pile up behind the house and I, you know, I, I put the flashlight down. I'm like, hey, there's blood right here. He goes, oh yeah, my son shot a deer the, the other week, which he did too. So... And I reached, I reached down and I touched the, the mm. drag mark and I'm like, this is fresh blood. And then there's blood dripping off my hands, you know, with a flashlight on it. And he's like, you got me, you got me. It's in the garage, you know? So I went from there. And then, you know, again, if you want more details, you got to listen to my uh, second podcast, uh, my best cases, because these are my best cases and I love them dearly because I went from there loading that tr- deer in the back of my truck and we were supposed to run a decoy that night so my lieutenant's like you still want to run a decoy i'm like absolutely well you know i, I had some places picked out and he's like you want to get so-and-so don't you i'm like absolutely you know because i was putting it in their haunts because that's what a game warden should know is where these poachers mm-hmm. are operating and how they're operating whether they're baiting ducks and shooting ducks over bait or whether they're baiting deer or whether they're night hunting it's our jobs to figure out what the bad guys are doing. And like I said, sometimes we can call them by name. Sometimes we don't. But we should have an idea where people are operating in our areas and where they're doing the bad stuff. And it usually it coordinates with the, the population of animals. If it's a high population here, you might, you might get them there. So if we put a decoy out and, uh, you know, these guys came down 2 o'clock in the morning, both drunk as skunks, and uh, shot it. And it was great. And uh, I had information that they had a contest going on who could poach the most deer that year among this group of of guys that i caught two of them so you know whether that was true or not i haven't been able to you know confirm it yet but uh one of the the guys that was in that group uh, i'm going to call him a reform poacher he's one of those guys i never caught that you know i saw at one point and we we had a little chat and he kind of i'm like what about this what about that and you know, several times I was really close to catching him, but I never caught him. And, it, and the nice thing is, he, he when he had a son, 
he didn't want his son to grow up the way he did. So he started doing it the right way and he stopped poaching, you know, and uh, we that now we can have these conversations. And, uh, you know, I call him my reform poacher. And uh, but he tells me all the things that were going on. And I, I still haven't asked him about that because he was right in the middle of that group, too whether there was actually a contest, but I'm pretty sure there was a contest and, you know, these guys were out. Kind of, what blows my mind is, you know, I listened to, and I don't know if, uh, if, if you've listened to it and I'm sure you're definitely familiar with it. Uh, gosh, I can't remember the guy's name right now, but they call him the, the Prince of poaching. Yeah. Um, that was poaching all them big deer and very, very crazy manners. Um, mm. on the King ranch down there in, in Texas, uh, I think near Brownsville. Um, right. but literally getting, you know, amphibious, uh, inserts, <laughs> uh, onto the beach and, and things of that nature. Um, I, what kind of blew my mind is, is that there's this little ring, uh, they were running in these little rungs, you know, the outlaw rings. I don't, I don't understand how that exists. Um, when you're, when you're doing stuff like that, because usually, you know, <laughs> if I, someone once told me, Hey, you know, if you're going to don't do, don't do anything illegal. Don't do anything wrong. But if you do, don't tell anyone. <laughs> um, and cause that's how you get caught. Right. It, it, um, it really is. Yep. But and you, how do they, how do they go around operating like that? Uh, they do. They do. And that that's absolutely. And I don't know how they do it either, but it's kind of that click thing that, you know, again, you know, Tell your friends, you know, hey, I just shot this last night or that. And then that guy's going to go out and do one better. So, you know, they whether they grew up doing it or whether they acclimated to it because they're trying to get the biggest and the best. You're right. They, 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 they gravitate towards each other. And it's usually a group of friends that probably have grown up together and have grown up in that type of violating themes. So, um yeah, or, or guys that really want to get it, you know, you know, this is, I got to cheat to do it. So, because I can't do it legally now, whether you're not allowed on that ranch, so I got to cheat to do it, whether you're, you know, I got to cheat to do it because I can't, I, I don't have the skill set to do it the right way, or I'm lazy, which is most of these guys thing when they, they're driving around and shooting things or shooting out their back door. But, you know, and, and technology is changing, too. I mean, we have uh, infrared sensors that are coming down in prices and the way game wardens do business is changing and the way poachers are doing business is changing. So it, it's it's really different. So like you said, that guy who, you know, put him amphibious, you know, inserted himself amphibiously and stuff. He's thinking another way. We're thinking on how to catch him. He's thinking on how to kill this thing, no matter what it takes you know, laws out the window. This is what I got to do. And this is, you know, how I'm going to do it without laws, without thinking about laws. So, and that's how the poacher thinks. And then it's the bragging rights, because if you shoot this stuff and you can't talk about it, what good has it been? Mm -hmm. You know, it's the guy that sure stuff and maybe needs to fill his freezer and doesn't care what he shoots and throws it in the freezer and done. We'll probably never catch him because he's not going to tell another soul in the world. So, you know, and then you never hear about it. The guy that drags it in his backyard, skins it out, butchers it, throws it in his freezer. You know, if, if no one runs across him, you know, we're probably not going to catch him because he's not going to brag about shooting a bunch of does and skippers to fill his freezer. If that's in case. Right. In this day and age, there's no reason to fill your, you know, I always hear the old stories, um, you know, just coming back from World War II and stuff. There wasn't a lot of meat and, you know, there was a lot of poaching going on. And the warden used to say, hey, you've got enough deer this year to fill, feed the family, so, you know, stop poaching. So I, I hear those, and I, I, I guess that did exist back then, as they were literally trying to feed their families with wild game because they just came back from the war, and the farms weren't being run the way they were because all the men were off. But this day and age, I've got roadkill. I've got roadkill lists. There's no need to go out and illegally kill something to fill your freezer because I can fill your freezer if if you want it filled, you know, because I have a roadkill list. And if you want to be on it and here's, you know, deer gets hit here, they call you up, you go get it, you butcher it, and it's in your freezer. So it's just not, you know, some of, some of the guys that worked for me, you know, like, why'd you give that deer to him? He's a poacher. I'm like, well, if his freezer full, he can't throw another deer in it, can he? 
So, <laughs> you know, th- th- those types of things. It's just the, the way we operate today compared to the, we, what we did 40 years ago is very, very different. Yeah. Jeez. Uh, so I got a, I got just a couple more questions here. I really do want to ask you. Um, there's something that still has you scratching your head today uh, <laughs> from your career. Scratching my head. What is it? Oh, there, there's, there's so many guys that I probably didn't catch that I should have. And the, the nice thing is some of these new guys coming in are catching guys that I chased for a while. And, and because they look at it a different way and they go about it a different way, they're catching them. Um, it's pretty neat. Uh, <laughs> Glenn, Glenn, Glenn Lucas worked for me and uh, he made a case last year, a shining case. Well, it was a, it's, it's a, a motion sensor light on a bait pile that's that they put about 300 feet away from the house. So when the deer comes up, the motion sensor light comes on and uh, you know, he had a deer shot off. He can't put it that it was uh, after dark. So he, he, he charged him with shining. And I guess I never thought of it that way. But if you look at the law, he is illuminating wildlife, you know, because he's doing it from his house with a motion sensor light, you know, that's 300 feet away on a bright pile. You know, that, that's a different way to look at it. And I never did. My predecessors never did. And when you look at the law, I'm like, why didn't I think of that? And it's infuriating, you know, that I didn't look at it that way. I, I, I like new guys and I like them to look at it a different perspective. Um, yeah, I've got some cases that, you know, I, I, I would have liked to run with my lieutenant told me to back off when, you know, I was ready to get an excavator and dig up a bear. And I, I, to this day, I know it was illegal. I know I could have charged him. Would I have won it in court? Maybe not, but it would have felt a I'm lot. Sorry. Re, re-explain that. What'd you say? And what, what was he doing? Uh, he, he shot a bear I- illegally. Now he had a preseason bait that I didn't find till after, but he tells me the story. So I'm like, so I bring him back. I'm like, where'd you shoot the bear? He's like, oh, it was coming. It was a sand pit, mind you. Um, it was coming up over that bank, and I shot it over there. I'm like, really? I'm like, where were you standing? He's like, oh, over here. So he walks over there and shows me. I was standing right here behind this this dirt pile, and the bear came up over there, and I shot it. I said, geez, how long did you stand here for? He goes, oh, you know, probably two hours, I bet. I said, really? I said, uh, and that was last night? He's like, yep, yep, last night. I said, has it rained? Did it rain last night? He's like. No, it didn't rain. I said, then why are your footprints the only footprints down there? There's no other footprints besides yours and me walking up here. So I would imagine standing there and walking those, you would have had footprints. Well, he looks down, he looks around, and then he loses it. And he just starts swearing and yelling at me because I had come to the conclusion, A, he was lying, and B, that was a bunch of crap. Well, he had shot that bear that night, and he had buried it in that sand pit with an excavator. So all my evidence is buried. So I wanted to get an excavator and dig it all up. So my Lieutenant told me, no, then I'm like, why not? You know, <laughs> you know, and he was, yeah. no, nope, we can't do that. We can't do that. And to this day, you know, that, that kind of thing grates on me. Cause I think if I had a, a new guy do that, I would have been like, absolutely. I'll, I'll run the excavator, you know, cause <laughs> you know, so, but it was just, you know, did I have enough then probably to charge him? No. Could I have got that bear, dug it up? And who knows if it was even there? It, it, you know, a week later, I found his illegal bait pile. So, um, you know, could I prove it that it was preseason baited? No, I couldn't because it, it was during the season that I found it. Um, did I check it year after year after year after year after that? Absolutely. Did he ever preseason bait it again? No. Um, I, I created quite a stir because I went from house to house to house and I campus people. And I got a guy that told me he heard shots at nine o'clock that night. Um, so I started using that. Well, that guy got ostracized out of the, the whole community for talking to the game warden and telling him that. And there was actually, you know, his, him and his neighbor got in and mixed it up. And he actually got the guy that gave me the information got arrested because him and his neighbor got an argument over giving me information and he swung and hit his neighbor. So he got arrested for assault. So, you know, it was quite the stir over a case that I didn't make, but I I kept prodding and prodding and prodding. So um, I actually sent wardens because one of the guys was from Kentucky 
that was involved in this case. So I went, I sent wardens to his house to do an interview down there as well. Cause I, I just didn't want to let it go. So, um, yeah, that, that one's still burning to me, Ben. So, um, he got away. I, I think I would have had enough to charge him, but I was a fairly new officer and I was full of, uh, piss and vinegar. So sometimes the lieutenant that sits back and uh, looks at it from a different angle uh, probably, you know, can, can make a better call. I'm not going to say it was a bad call because I hate to, you know, do the Monday morning Monday uh, morning quarterback thing. But um, yeah, right. yeah, Burns don't like don't like losing. I, I you most of your game wardens don't like losing, so that's why we try to no. get the best case we can in order to to prove it in a court of law. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I told a guy once that I've never seized a house before, but you know, I was going to try like heck. So, um, and I, I really planned on trying to seize his house. He, he had shot a deer illegally. It was, uh, using again, the backyard method, the, the motion light from his house. Um, you know, I got him to, could, <laughs> I, 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 during the interview, I said, you know what, I've never taken a house before, but I'm going to try like heck to take this house. and. I think he knew I was serious. The truck was coming with me. That was for sure. You know, if things didn't change around, the deer was coming with me. But I've never taken a house before. But, you know, I'm going to try. It, it was it was used in the taking of this deer. And the law says that I can take the implements of the use, whether it's the vehicle, the knife, the firearm, the light. Well, the light came from the house. And I, I was like, you know what? I've never done it, but I'm going to try. And I think that's that switched him around. He's like, this guy's crazy. He's going to try to take my house because I shot a deer, you know. And I, I, I absolutely was yeah. going to try it. <laughs> that's wow. That's I wow. didn't have to. He came to uh, his milk. So, so and uh, you know, we got a, we got a night hunting case out of it. So, so I, I keep describing those backyard things. We we had quite a I've had quite a few of those in my career, and I think the guys in the future are going to have quite a few more of these backyard incidents because uh you know that's where a lot of the poaching's going on is right in people's backyards so excluding the obviously the time where uh you were shot in the line of duty that's your story to tell and that is uh in no way shape or form a respectful question to ask uh what's you know i, I asked you before you know what's your head scratcher but what's uh one of your heart pumpers like whoo man um that was intense slash crazy um and i'm glad to be here now you know mm. yeah, i should have had these before and then i could have thought about it a little more i um, know i'm <laughs> sorry <laughs> well that's that, that's that's quite all right um you know uh new hampshire has search and rescue too so there is some um, some heart pounding uh, incidents. And I think of a search and rescue. We were, uh, we were a mission we're on. And again, you can hear this in the, the Colonel and I, it's, it's like number three of my podcasts. I, I talk about this and uh, Mount Washington is the highest peak in the Northeast, uh, 6,280 feet. Uh, lots of search and rescues missions. We were looking for a woman. Um, Chaput was her name. Her last name was Chaput. She was from Canada. She, we found her Thanksgiving Day, and I, I forget the year, uh, but she was actually murdered too. So that's that's another part of the story. But the night we were looking for, her, it was Thanksgiving night that me and the colonel were out, and we were on top of Mount Washington, and it was snowing, and it was blowing, and we we just gotten GPSs and. He was running the GPS we had, and I, I, you know I didn't even believe in a GPS. I was like, what the heck. It, it was getting nasty. It was getting cold. You could, you know, we we were the carns that we navigate with when you lose a tree line. They pile these rocks up to make a point and they're called carns. So that's how you navigate. So I would stay at one of these carns as he would go out and look for the next carn so we could see each other's flashlight. And he would flash me the flashlight when he found the next carns and I would move to him. So. And I was like, you know, finally, I'm like, let's let's go back. This is crazy. This is crazy. We're going to die up here. You know, it's cold. It's blowing. It's nasty. We can't hear a thing. 
And, you know, I'm, I'm arguing with him. He's like, no, it's quicker to go this way. It's quicker to go this way. The GPS, the GPS. And I'm like, yeah, I don't care about that stupid GPS. Let's go back the way we came. And I look back and all of our tracks where we had are blown away. You can't even see where we've walked within, you know, 10 feet of us. Totally wiped out because the wind and the snow. So I'm like, there goes that, that idea. So, I mean, so we, we, we made it off the, the boot spur trail and, and down the mountain. But I'll, I'll tell you what. That, that was that was uh, one of those times where, you know, I'm like, you know, this is really nasty. And are we going to make it off this mountain? Uh, that that mountain has killed. And I, I don't even know what the the total is, because every year it adds. Uh, people don't take uh, the, the eastern mountains real seriously compared to the western mountains. They're pretty short. Yeah. But where the white mountains fall, there's like three different weather fronts that hit that spot. And if trees can't grow there, there's a reason for it. So. And, you know, we have quite a few peaks that don't have trees on them. It's just rocks. And it takes the world's worst weather. The, the, the highest wind speed recorded has been on Mount Washington. So it, it's, it's a very gnarly, gnarly place. I've uh, been on a rescue where we had to drive snowmobiles. We'd drive snowmobiles 10 feet and walk, the, you know, the 10 feet. And then so you didn't drive off the cliffs. So, and we would, you know, just keep bumping, walk 10 feet drive the snowmobiles 10 feet, walk 10 feet, drive the snowmobiles 10 feet, because that's all you couldn't see. You were in the clouds and it was just gnarly again. And you had a snowmobile this time, but you know, you're trying to stay on the auto road, which goes to the top and try to navigate and it's pitch dark and the clouds are in, in you're in the clouds. And that, that's probably some of the dangerous parts of, uh, you know, being a conservation officer in New Hampshire is the search and rescue with what we do in the extreme weather. Um, you know, other guys have been in worse situations as a, as a lieutenant. I've put guys in really bad situations that I, I didn't really want to. Um, I asked guys that they, 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 you know, I was, saw a couple guys the other day, they were busting my chops. I had them sleep out overnight in a downpour because it would have took them three hours to get back to where they were the next morning to look for this guy. And I'm like, can you just hunker down and stay right there? Because, you know, three hours out, three hours back, you know to put them in the right search area. So they hunkered down and, and through a downpour stayed up there, which, you know, it's, it's, as, a, as a supervisor, it really sucks when you're putting other people in harm's way. You know, you don't yeah. sleep well to do that. So, no, no, it's especially when you, you can't make it right by being out there <laughs> sleeping yeah. in the in the rain. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's been an exciting career in New Hampshire because of the search and rescue um, you know, being in northern New Hampshire, it's it's pretty rural. It's it's still that uh, backcountry type theme. Everybody knows who a game warden is, what a game warden does. Um, you know, yeah, this that this, there's this been some some times that you know the hair on the back of my neck uh, uh, stands up. Um, you know, I talk about when I was talking to Chris McCabe. I talk about the time I I pulled my gun and I thought I was gonna have to shoot this guy, and it was just uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's one of those. The sixth sense that it was just the weirdest thing. I just walked up to him. He had his trunk open. It was a big car, like a Lincoln or something. It was, you know, wasn't the best shape or whatever. And he had gas cans in it, but you know, we always, we're always stealthy as game wardens. And, you know, I'm standing right next to him and I'm like, uh, what you doing? And he snaps up, he looks at me and he starts running for his, the, the car. And I'm like, Hey, stop, 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 you know, please stop. And he dives in across the sea and like he reaches for something and he is reaching for something and he spins in his seat. I already got my gun out and I'm taking the slack out of it because I'm expecting to see a gun and it's his wallet in his hand and he's, he's disabled, mentally disabled somehow, some way he doesn't talk very clearly and he wanted me to get his ID. And, but my heart, I, I, I didn't even care at that time. I'm like, yeah, I don't care. I don't care. You know, the adrenaline had been sent through me so much you know that i was like <laughs> you, know, you know and i can see where those mistakes are made because you have a split second to make that decision and is that guy spinning in in the in the driver's seat and i'm expecting to see a gun and there's a wallet and i'm like what the heck why but that because he whether he had issues hearing or was mentally you know I don't think he was a bad guy. He was homeless. It looked like he was living out of his car and he wanted me to, to see his ID. 
And that's and to him, that was the most important thing was for to get that wallet to get to him. You know, he wasn't listening to anything I said, and you know, I surprised him. Yeah. So that you know, that 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 that, that takes <laughs> a little. So, um, yeah, Jeez. yeah. Those, those those are the. I'm glad that I'm glad that, that ended up okay for you there, Wayne. And, and me so, because what a horrible thing for an officer to do. You know, had I squeezed that trigger and, you know, I would have lived to that the rest of my life. You know, that's what a horrible thing. So, you know, sometimes I think we're willing almost to take a bullet just to make sure we're in the right that much more. So, and we got, unfortunately, we got police officers dying across this country, probably because they're, they're they want to make absolutely sure they're in the right. So, and that's those split second decisions are hard. And until you're in the position, it's hard to say what you would do. So... I, it's hard to, to judge these guys when you say, geez, they, they shot the kid because he had a cell phone in his hand. Yeah, maybe if it looked like he was pulling a gun. I, I understand that. I get it because I was almost there. So, but yeah. I will always say, you know, when the, we have a sixth sense, I swear everybody has it. Some of them, people are more in tuned. And I always listen to mine and it always seemed to be right. So when I thought something was wrong, it usually was. So, um, <laughs> so. Yeah, that was one of those hair raising things that you know, I'll, I'll never forget as a warden. And uh, there, there's a lot, a lot of them. You know, it's 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 great because the more I talk, the more I I think back on my career, the more experiences that I can share that that you know were there. And you know, especially some of the guys, I, I really liked working with my guys. I got night hunting cases with all of them except for Jim Sear before I left, and I tried like heck to make a case with him. So I could say before I left that everybody. I was with everybody when we made a night hunting case and I was usually the guy that picked, you know, where we were going to do it, how we were going to do it. Cause I, I felt like I was in tuned with it and it, it was awesome to have that experience with the other officers and, and it, it carries on their memories about me and about that night hunting case and, and the same with them. So awesome. Well, Wayne, thank you so much for coming on uh, to the foul front. Uh, before we, you know, remind everybody uh, about what you're doing with the Warden's Watch, uh, what do you want to leave the the listeners of the Foul Front with? Yeah, I just want to let them know that, you know, the game wardens aren't the enemy. You know, when we come out to check you, it's just to make sure everybody's in compliance. Um, and it's for everybody's benefit. It's for the resource benefit. It's for the hunter's benefit. You know, I just want to make sure that everybody knows that we're, we're, we're not the enemy. And as a matter of fact, I hope you're on our side. I hope when you see that violation that you pick up and you call it, whether it's the operation game thief line or turn in a poacher or, you know, international wildlife crime stoppers has all those listed for each state as well. The contact information. So if you're in another state, you can go on their website, click the state and it, and it tells you how to report poaching. So when there's early shooting, late shooting, um, over limits that you're experiencing, you know, pick up the phone, be, be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. You know, if we're all working in this together, the resource benefits from that. And I, I always think I see these management plans that, you know, are put together and they forget the law enforcement because the, the biologists, I always, I love this word, can bi biologize all they want. They, the legislator can put laws into effect, but w without law enforcement, it, it, it's nothing. We are part of that management plan and we are, and so is the, the, the sportsmen, you know, they can put themselves in that management plan by helping us out. And a lot of them do by, you know, by, you know, buying duck stamps that purchases property. They are, they are part of the solution too. So, but don't forget the law enforcement side. You know, if you see a problem, just don't ignore it and say, you know, yeah, the warden will catch it. Cause I'm only, you know, one set of eyes and one set of ears. You know, we multiply that by bringing good sportsmen in to look, hey, that guy just shot a whole bunch of ducks or he started shooting 30 minutes early, you know, and if you get checked or even if you pick up the phone and say, hey, they were here and this is the plate number they're driving. You know, this is where they were hunting. Maybe they're going to do the same thing the next day or the warden sees that plate again some other place. Now he's got a little bit of information to work. So it, it's, it helps. And, you know, for you guys to be help to us, I think is an important thing to be part of that solution and not part of the problem. I guess that's what I want to leave. And, uh, awesome. you know, I, I support my sportsmen as much as they support me. Awesome. All right. So if you enjoyed any of this conversation, 
Um, you need to go check out the Warden's Watch uh, with Wayne Saunders. Um, and so what do you got coming up on the Warden's Watch? Uh, I've got so much in the tube. I'm not sure what I'm going to throw out next. Uh, you know, I, I'm really excited to be doing the podcasting thing. So I've been doing a lot of in-person interviews when I have opportunities. Um, I've got uh, Ohio, who had their biggest deer hunting case ever. Um, I've got a good friend of uh, mine talking about that, who ran the covert operation. Um, so that that's coming up this fall. Um I've got some some of my officers that uh that I know Todd Shefchek who I came on with who's probably one of the best investigators I've ever had a chance to work with. He talks about some cases and it's kind of funny because that's one of my earlier stuff and I don't have the good quality equipment that I do now so it's you know the handheld uh, microphone type stuff and so that might be a little choppy but um you know I, I got some other things coming up too. I'm working on some search and rescue stuff for the winter. But I'm going to try to focus on hunting and, uh, you know, I want to throw different things in every now and then maybe an interview with some biologists so we can get some uh, feel for what they feel and include the law enforcement aspect of it. So I wish I could really tell you what I got coming up. I, I, I've got things planned, but I'm not really sure until I get there what I put out. So this last one, um, you know, I did was with uh, Nick um, Bronson from Nevada, my first cowboy game warden. Uh, it was a great, it was a great, great interview. interview. Yeah, and, and I, I just enjoyed it because, you know, I, like I said, I grew up reading Lewis Lamore books, you know, that Western style. And here I got one sitting right in front of me, the cowboy. Uh, so that, that that was interesting to me. And I'm hoping if it's interesting to me, it's going to be interesting to the other listeners as well. Um, just trying to diversify things, uh, make it interesting. You know, I will say the Northwoods Law, the Lone Star Law, has certainly helped. I think in the in doing the law enforcement, wildlife law enforcement uh, podcast. It seems like those people are gravitating to it as well, and it's kind of the behind the scenes type of uh, the TV shows, the things you probably don't hear about. So it's been fun. I'm having a time with it. I hope my colleagues are too. You know, it's their stories as much as mine, and I tell them it's their show as much as it's my show. So. Hopefully, uh, we'll continue on. We'll hear some good stories because we all have some good stories. 